often we set goals for ourselves that are unmanageable. And so I'm hoping today that we can set some goals that we could actually achieve. And that primary goal is going to be self-care to overcome stress and burnout. So welcome. Um, I've set two goals for myself this year. Well, it's one that leads to the second, but it's being, it, my goal is neutrality to increase joy. Um, because sometimes I can be reactive and dramatic, as you may have guessed from watching some of these videos or joining me. So welcome. I'd like to hear uh, what one of your goals is and how that goal um, is going to uh, manifest itself by improving self-care. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is the goal that you have for yourself? Hi, Gina from Florida. Welcome. Hi, Sonia from Michigan. Hi, Susan from California. Hi, Anne from Sweden. Hi, Lo Laura from Cincinnati. Hello, Sonia. Your goal is to read more. Wonderful. I'd like to hear why reading more feels nurturing to you. Hi, Gina. I'd like to clear out some clutter and get more organized. Wonderful. Tell me why clearing out some clutter and, clutter and getting more organized feels nurturing to you. Um, hello, Tina from Texas. My goal is less procrastination. Again, I'd like to hear more. Why is this nurturing for you? Bob from Philly. Hi. Your goal is to find a job for the first time in four years. Oh, let's, let's all wish you well in that. Um, I can imagine why that feels nurturing, but I'd love to hear from you. So I think as we welcome 2024, what I would like to do first is to really talk a little bit about um, stress uh, and what you might be carrying from 2023. I have a brand new hot off the press downloadable for you on overcoming stress and burnout. And I'm going to put that in the chat so that you can get it. So let's see what we've got here. Um, Sonia, it's forcing me to take the time to sit and focus on something I want to do instead of always focusing on others. Yes, reading can do that. Plus it takes you hopefully to a new place or it brings in new information that can be very exciting. Um, oops, my computer did something weird, sorry. Um, let's see, Laura, your goal is less cut clutter and more motivation. Um, how would that feel nurturing to you? Um, Tina, less procrastinating will get me moving, exercising, and feeling accomplished. So a couple of you have mentioned uh, procrastination and also organization. And I'd love to start with um, talking about the three different kinds of procrastination. So we know that there are three types of procrastinators. There are perfectionist procrastinators. And perfectionist procrastinators have two, uh, there's two parts to this. One is you want something to be right and you're not afraid you're gonna get it right so you don't start. And the other is you really want something to be right. So you get started, you're motivated to do it, but then somewhere along the way, it seems like it's not going the way you would like it to go. And so you stop, or you can never quite say it's good enough and turn it in to whoever needs that thing or close that project. So that can be very frustrating for perfectionist procrastinators. I do a little bit of that. If any of you are perfectionist procrastinators, please let us know in the chat. The second type of procrastination is avoidance procrastination. And this is when the task that we have to do is really unappealing. No matter what we have in mind, um, it's better than doing this particular task. And so that task grows in terms of its size. So it goes maybe a small task like taking the trash out, but because it's unpleasant, it becomes bigger and bigger and then you, you, the more that you avoid it, the bigger that it becomes. And then it becomes incredibly problematic. So um, uh, people who avoid things often are mad at themselves for the things they avoid, wish they didn't avoid things, and in general um, can feel really bad about themselves um, uh, the more that they put something off. The third type of procrastination is uh, productive procrastination. Uh, Dr. Russell Ramsey calls this procrastivity, 
And this is when we do other things that need to be done instead of the thing we really don't want to do. Um, so we're feeling productive and we're getting stuff done, but we're not doing it in the way that would actually accomplish the goal that we have set for ourselves. And a lot of us with ADHD do that. I'm definitely one of those. So I'm a combination, a little perfectionistic and, produ and productive. I'd love to hear from you, what kind of procrastinator are you? And what kind of, pro what kind of um, tools or techniques have you found that helps you reduce your procrastination? Because it's one thing to wish to procrastinate less, and I think that's a great goal. It's another thing to take action-oriented steps. And when we take those action-oriented steps to reduce procrastination, we feel better about ourselves and we start to get things done. So let's see what we hear here. Um, let's see, um, Tina, less procrastinating will get me moving, exercising, and feeling pro accomplished. Wonderful. Anne says, I'm one of those. So you're one of the pro perfectionists, I guess. Tina, me, perfectionist procrastinator with hobbies I'd like to do. Ooh, say more. Um, this is going to be a very conversational uh, Facebook Live today um, because we have the right number of people for that to occur. And I'd really like to help each and every one of you start this new year on a foot that you feel good about. Um, Laura says, the clutter in my house causes me to have anxiety, but I can't find the motivation to do it. Or I get overwhelmed, so I give up and eat. Mm. A tidier house will allow me to focus on me so I can get healthier by eating less and exercising more. Right, so in, in some ways, you're, pro, you're procrastinating um, uh, doing the clutter, which feels like a horrible task uh, in front of you, actually increases your anxiety, and then you feel bad about yourself, so you eat, and then you feel worse about yourself. So one of the, the, the main tools for reducing procrastination, and everybody talks about this, is chunking. Breaking things down into smaller pieces. So instead of having the goal, I need to clean the whole kitchen, maybe the goal is I'm only going to clean, you know, this one square foot of the kitchen. Or maybe I'm going to um, deal with dishes, but I'm not going to deal with papers. Or the other way. So. Um, we really want to think about what it is that we can do, uh, for what, is, what part of a task that we could do to break it down so that it seems more manageable. And I'm curious, uh, for those of you who are um, watching and you want to procrastinate less, where is the th area that you procrastinate the most? Where do you procrastinate the most? And what could we do to help reduce it? So again, I'd like to hear from you about um, a, some goals that you have for this year and some ideas you might have about working towards those goals. So Sonia, your goal is to read more. When do you think you're going to do that? How are you going to do that? Uh, Gina, you'd like to clear up some clutter and get more organized. Fantastic, where do you want to start and how do you want to start? Bob from Philly, you want to find a job. How are you going to start that process? That's a big chunk, and I'm sure you've been looking. So what's going to make this time different than other times? Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about clutter, um, because clutter, there's a difference between uh, hoard, hoarding and having collections, and there's a difference between clutter and systems uh, where, uh, to, that you have to put things away. So maybe you haven't gotten to put it away, but you ha still have a system for where it's supposed to go. A lot of people I work with struggle with um, clutter because they don't know where things belong. Where is it going to live? And without knowing where something lives, it's very hard to figure out where to put it. Um, so the, for, the thing, for those of you who are struggling with clutter, I'd like to hear a little bit about the type of clutter you're struggling with and does it have a system? Do you have a system? Because if not, I could help you try to create one. So let's see, Cecilia, all three awarenesses help me and often taking a break and coming back to whatever it is I need to do. Wonderful, that sounds great. Tina, I want to start learning to paint. 
practice my drawing, creating art, and have tons of photography to have printed up and put up. Can't choose which is the best display. Will it look right? All the pictures are, are the pictures good enough? Tina, if I may, I'd like to explore this with you. So I think wanting to explore your creativity is fantastic. And you have a lot of photography that you want to, um, to uh, display. Um, what about uh, picking a subject for your photography and deciding on 10 photos? They don't have to be 10 perfect photos, but just 10 photos. Um, and then um, print, getting those printed out and seeing which of those you could put up and where. So narrowing your field. I had a picture frame that I literally bought, I don't know, 10 months ago um, to put, a, a, no, I bought, wait, we're in January. So I actually wanna say that, yes, I bought it like 10 months ago. And my goal was to put in pictures of my children and grandchildren. And uh, when exactly did I put the pictures of my children and my grandchildren in? November. So that would be um, a long time later. Why? I had a lot of pictures. I couldn't decide which ones. Uh, they all looked good. And so what I did was I made a subfolder on my computer and I just put, you know, the best pictures, the, my favorite pictures in there. And there was like maybe, you know, 20 of them. And then I narrowed those down to what I think, you know, I could fit in my frame, which had seven pictures or eight pictures and I printed out eight. They weren't the eight perfect ones. I'm sure there were ones that were better, but I printed those out and I picked them up and I, and I put them in the frame. I didn't print them. Somebody, I got them printed to be honest at Walmart. And then I put them in the frame and I hung up the frame and I thought, okay, it's not perfect, but at least it's completed. I don't have pictures of strangers in my picture frame in my office. And that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect because I'm not, because it took me 10 months to do that. But what I am saying is that um, I, I decided that something was better than perfect. Good enough is better than perfect. And the only person who can decide good enough is you. And you are also the one holding the standard of perfection to yourself. Because here's the thing, you, the part of you that thinks you're not perfect also isn't perfect. Look at that. So we want to try to shift this conversation a little bit. So pick something and start there. Hi, Lynn. Welcome. Nice to see you. Um, okay. Um, you always had a home for everything until you had a kid, says Laura, LOL. So it actually helps you and it helps your kids figure out how to where things go so that they can help put things away when they know where it lives um, maybe it's a bunch of bins that come in a container and you know you put things in those bins the, you could have special bins for certain things or just bins where the toys go and there it doesn't matter which toys go in which bins but they're not out so we want to try to really adjust the expectation that whatever system we have has to be in a particular way for it to be effective. And it doesn't, you just need a system of some kind. Um, let's see, uh, Susan says, piles of paper, ki kitchen clutter. So if piles of paper and kitchen clutter are eating away at you, start with one pile, start with one subject. I'm going to work on junk mail mail that is not related to anything that I have to do or I want to read about. In that case, you can start to make a pot, to have a, a bin, a bag of recyclable um, stuff that you, is just junk mail, stuff I want to save and have because I need to do something with and stuff I'm interested in like um, a catalog or a, 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 a gardening supplies that you want for the spring, or um, uh, maybe um, a magazine that comes that interests you. So you have three different piles and then you uh, put stuff in that, in that. So you're starting to reduce the clutter. You may not get rid of the clutter, but we're gonna reduce it. And now we have homes. We have homes for the stuff that you're saving because you have to do something with it, and stuff that you wanna read or come back to. 
This kind of simplistic organization will help you start the year feeling like you're making progress on your goal. Cecilia, large strategic document writing is like giving birth, so painful. So I'm not sure what your goal is. Cecilia, can you clarify? Tina, doing hobbies will keep me occupied and avoid boredom. Doing hobbies not just keeps you occupied and avoid boredom, which is true, but it also nurtures you in a kind of self-care, and that's part of what we're talking about today. To start this new year, to reduce stress, is to figure out what actually fills your own bucket. What helps you feel good about you? What is something that brings you joy? Um, and this is a great way to do it. So having, maybe you don't need to start three hobbies, maybe one hobby. Maybe it's just the photography for the next three months and then you can check back in and say, okay, I've done that for three months, I'm ready to try something else. Or not, you can come tell me your ideas about it. Let's see. Um, uh, Susan, my puppy is not a puppy anymore. He will be three in February. Thank you for asking about Milo. Um, and I have a system for our clutter, but my husband and my kids just don't use it, even if I'm reminding them every time. So, Anne, this is an excellent point to bring up. This system that you create for clutter has to work for everybody. And so this is a great topic to have for a family meeting. And you can start small. What are we doing with our coats, our hats, our, where I live, boots, um, you know, lunch boxes? What is the system and where does it belong? Because, um, and that, that they, everyone gets to have a say in creating this system. And if they don't want to participate in creating the system, then the default, of course, is your system. So have a meeting, let people have the option of having a say, and then determine what that system's gonna be. And I would encourage you to just keep a system for one thing in one conversation, and then come back to the others. Laura, I never did my wedding album because I had to choose from hundreds and hundreds of photos. My husband and I kept procrastinating because there were too many choices. Ironically, 15 years later, we're getting a divorce. Wow, I'm not sure exactly how to respond. So on the one hand, um, is getting a divorce something positive? On the other, you know, um, do you want a hug um, about it? Um, and I think wedding albums and things like that where there are hundreds and hundreds of photos to choose from are very difficult. And in that case, you might wanna ask your photographer to narrow the field. Narrowing the field is critical for being able to both organize, but also get started on something to reduce your procrastination. Tina, yes, minimalism does help. Gina, I was very organized in my old house. I moved to a new house a couple of years ago, so things are all over the place and unorganized. It's very stressful and overwhelming. I hear what you're saying, that can be really hard. So when you move to a new house, probably there were so many options in terms of what you had to organize, you couldn't come up with one that worked and was quick enough to do. So you know what I would encourage you to do is maybe go room by room or again, subject by subject. And when I say subject, what I mean is, okay, I'm gonna organize um, silverware. I'm gonna organize glasses. I'm gonna put my find a place for my winter clothes. It's not even that you have to organize the glasses when you put them away. It's finding a place for them to go. Then you can deal with the organizing. But when everything is out and about, what happens for a lot of people with ADHD is we are so visually stimulated that we can't reduce um, uh, the, what we're seeing into a manageable chunk and we can't approach anything because we sort of go into shutdown, like a freeze mode. Um, uh, let's see, um, okay. Laura says yes to, pa to piles of paper. Tina, Laura, no, you're good. The divorce is healthy for me. Okay, great, glad to hear it. So, um, and the marriage was extremely stressful. So now you don't have to save any of the pictures or you can save one or two if you want. If you have kids, you might wanna save some of those pictures because they might want pictures of when their parents were married. But just pick, 
you know, a handful, uh, literally, you know, five or six, if that's the case, or have them pick out their favorites and you don't have to be involved at all. Uh, Jennifer, I'd like to talk about the need for perfection. My son suffers from this and then ends up with nothing. How can I help him get over the hump into getting something done? Jennifer, this is such a fantastic question um, because what happens is that when people um, suffer from perfection, um, and I do this myself sometimes, I, I'm not sure that I have enough time to actually do it properly, so I'll put it off until you know, then I have no time to do it and I'll be up late and rushed and very stressed, which is bad for blood, my blood pressure. And so for kids, what we want to do is to break down the task. So instead of a task being a, a very large task, um, the smaller that the task is, the greater the likelihood is that he can start because it's a manageable chunk. And it may or may not be perfect, but it doesn't matter as much because it's small. So if he wants to get something small just right, that's a lot easier than getting something big just right. And we again want to remind him that the part of him that thinks he needs to be perfect also is not perfect. And so there's a, like this sort of cycle of, of almost toxic, toxicity that goes on around. Tina, how does one stop the shame talk when you haven't done something that needs to be done? That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, we've had a lot of sessions on shame and I'm sure we'll have more. I think the main thing that you have to do uh, to stop shame when you haven't done something that needs to be done is to be able to practice uh, forgiveness and acceptance. And that is part of the self-care theme for today. So you have to do something that needs to get done and maybe you only get half of it done. That's better than nothing or maybe you don't get any of it done and you have set aside a time specifically for tomorrow to get started with a small thing, a small aspect of it. What we need to be able to say to ourselves when we don't do something that we think we need to do is something kind. So I'd love to hear from you, Tina, what is something kind that you could say to yourself? What is something you would say to a friend who hasn't completed something that they need to do? or to a 10 year old that's skinned their knee on their, and fallen off their bicycle. These are the things that we need to start to learn to say to ourselves. Um, let's see. Oh, all the pictures are on a CD. The idea to have your son pick pictures is really good. Maybe not at this moment, but a good idea. Yeah, so you can save the CD and at some point at some, when he's older, if he wants, he can look at it. Laura, what will bring me joy is a clutter-free home and a skinny body, LOL. But seriously, when I do declutter, I feel at peace. I feel healthier and I don't emotionally eat. Um, but it doesn't matter how many times I declutter, eventually it happens again. I decluttered my house three times over the holidays and it's a mess again. So two things, Laura, that I want to suggest to you. One, maybe you need family cleanup time at the end of every day. 10 minutes where everybody's picking their stuff up and putting it where it needs to go. Because if you're doing all the decluttering, that's a lot of burden on you. And secondly, maybe you need to do a, a, a clean, I call that a clean sweep at the end of the day. Um, and uh, maybe you also need to do a greater clean sweep at the end of a week. But if you have a daily 10, 15 minute routine of, you know, finding stuff, putting it where it lives, um, that sense of making progress will motivate you to keep going. Susan Richardson, baby steps are still steps in the right direction. Amen. I agree. And here's the thing, two steps forward and one step back is still forward progress. Okay, Tina, I'm hard on myself. Tough love. So, a lot of times people who uh, have ADHD and also some perfectionism can be very hard on themselves. There's a lot of life that you, where you've heard about how you've messed up or done the wrong thing and that is you know, very detrimental to your mental health. So I would like to encourage you to say something else like, um, and I'm gonna th give a couple options here. I wish that I had started that today I regret that I didn't. Here's my plan for tomorrow and how I'm gonna to get started. 
So you're thinking forward. You're honoring that you feel bad that you did it, but you're and you're not you're not kind of pretending that you don't. But you're pivoting. You're flipping it into what can I change about this for tomorrow? Nicol Nicoletta, for instance, one day I'd like to publish a collection of poems. Wonderful, but I procrastinate endlessly. The whole process is so chaotic in my brain, so I do nothing. For instance, I feel insecure with my writing. I cannot decide what poems to include, how to organize them, cannot choose a title for the book. The publisher's process is like a labyrinth in my head. By the way, I avoid making or answering or receiving phone calls, and this is catastrophic in all areas of my life, professionally, of course, but also as far as obligations and doctor's appointments are concerned. Um, Nicoletta, thank you for joining. Um, uh, with publishing your poems, um, to me, I think it would be most useful to have a weekly goal and a specific time that you're working on it. Um, and if you can't sort of decide what poems you want to include, or do you want to self-publish or go to a, a local publisher, um, then I think the thing that would be great is to ask people in your community, put something up on Facebook maybe, um, uh, hunt around. You know, I know in my community there's a press at a, 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 through a copy uh, store and they've published a few books um, by several people that I know. And so, um, you know, having someone on board, maybe getting an editor to start with, might be easier for you than trying to choose your own poems. It's very hard to edit your own work. Um, and in terms of making or answering phone calls, receiving them. I see this a lot with people with ADHD. There's a kind of uh, panic around making a phone call, a, a fear of saying the wrong thing, a fear of, um, of, of missing the point, um, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe a fear of who's on the other end and what they're going to say to you. Um, and so I would really encourage you to start uh, in an area where the phone call will be well received to practice your phone skills. Talking on the phone and you know, is a skill, and it's a skill that you learn. And for a lot of us who are older, we had to learn that skill because there was no, there were no cell phones, it was phone calls. Um, and so I think if you could start small by calling people who you know will receive your phone call positively, that would give you some practice in, in, in and confidence and then have a buddy with you to make a phone call. I have sat in my office with a number of clients while they've made phone calls that are hard for them. Phone calls to a college program they're interested in. If you're an, 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 an adult, um, whether it's an emerging adult or an, a, you know, an adult who's 50, um, phone calls to return um, for a, a, a job interview phone calls to make a doctor's appointment. So you may need a buddy to do this, and there's no shame in that. I think the important thing is that you allow yourself to get support. Yes, Laura, we do all need to help each other with this. I agree. So let's talk a little bit about um, how we can create more self-care in this year to reduce stress and overcome burnout. So that we, we know that stress is too much of something. And too much, um, too many things that we have to take care of, too many, um, too many responsibilities, too much clutter. And burnout is a sense of not enoughness. You don't have enough energy, you don't have enough confidence. And, and when people are living with per persistent stress, it actually turns into burnout because over time your, your, um, your supplies are just depleted. Um, we want to avoid burnout through self-care. And the way that we do self-care is a very personal thing. So I'd like to hear from you, what do you do that feels nurturing to yourself? Maybe it's a cup of tea in the afternoon. Maybe it's jogging five miles before you go to work. Um, one thing that I've started doing in 2023, which I'm very proud of, is I started swimming. And I had a very, very small goal, and my goal was once a week, swim once a week. I am still swimming once a week. 
I'm trying to swim and there are some weeks where I swim twice a week and that's a really special week, but I swim once a week. That's what I committed to because I know that if I committed to, to myself more than once a week, I would fail and then I would stop going. So a small self-commitment, that's what I would like to hear. A way that you actually feel good about yourself, that you're feeding that inner part of yourself. And I don't know what self-care was called before. I think that's a good question, but I certainly think it could be, have been called mindfulness, or it could have been called, um, like Kristen Neff calls it, self-compassion. Just kindness to ourselves. Gina, phone calls are very difficult for me as well. This is good advice. Thank you. You're welcome. I make lists of things to do, but then I'm afraid to look at it again because it's overwhelming. LOL. It's crazy. Everything seems important, so it's hard to make a smaller list. So, Laura, I have talked about this before, and I cannot emphasize enough taking a look at one of, uh, go to my website and look at some of the articles or even here on Attitude Mag on, on, on prioritizing. Um, because the thing is, you, everybody can do a brain dump, but when that brain dump is big and there's 12 items or 20 items on a list, you can't do those. And so we have to determine which items we want to do in terms of what's most urgent, and that's a time issue, and what's most important, that's a value issue. And you can look at that list of 20 things, and personally, I'd start with time, because that's the thing that stresses us out, that stresses me out a lot. You know, do I have enough time? When is it due? When do I need to have this finished by? Okay, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Tina says, self-care is getting outside. Yes, so therapeutic. And uh, that's, um, then add a camera to the mix. That's a great day in my book. Sounds fantastic, Tina, love it. Tammy, I crochet when I get home from teaching kindergarten. It calms my nerves. Wonderful, I love that. Um, Catherine, what if you're too tired to self-care? My daughter is 100% draining from attending university and I'm not sure how to help her. Well, this is an interesting question, Catherine, and um, I'm doing a webinar for Attitude in a few weeks on um, adulting, basically. Um, and uh, if your daughter is 100% drained from attending to university, then the conversation with your daughter is, I notice you're so exhausted when you get home. What helps you recharge? So, and maybe it's like, you know, being on her screens. That's fine for a little bit, but that's not actually going to fill up your energy tank. What's going to fill up your energy tank is, is getting yourself moving. A lot of research has shown that. Um, whether that's walking, yoga, um, tai chi, uh, swimming, you name it. But to, to have a list of five things that really help her feel a little more centered and grounded after being overwhelmed. I mean, obviously she needs to transition, um, but university is tiring. And so what's gonna fill that bucket so she doesn't go from stress to burnout? Thank you for that free downloadable. Um, again, I wanna just post my, um, my thing on stress and burnout, how to overcome it. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So I, there are really four things that I'd like you to think about in terms of reducing stress. Or three things, excuse me. First, pick one thing that um, seems to help reduce your tension. What is it? What is one thing that reduces your tension? Maybe it, you, you know, you don't even remember it's been so long, and that's okay. Uh, well, then we want to try some things. You might want to start with going outside. That's always great for so many people because it takes us outside of ourselves. The other day I was walking my dog with my friend who was walking her dog in the park across the street and we heard an owl. And then she went back the next day and she saw the owl. But we just sat listening to the owl and it was like a concert. Um, and that was so, that filled me up. It happened to be New Year's Eve and it was incredible. I hope when, um, I, I, when I get a chance, I can see the owl too. Secondly, how do we reduce stress? We adjust our time frames. 
forget about doing something for the next 12 months, making a change, a resolution. Let's focus on right now. A whole year resolution, it's too big, it's too amorphous, and it's daunting. Maybe think about doing something for a month. Mark a date on the calendar and check back with yourself about how it's, how it's working. Because you've scheduled, um, now you've scheduled a time to check back and you can also schedule when you're going to do that thing. So like, are you going to maybe meditate for 10 minutes every morning? Or are you going to do some stretching before you um, take care of the kids? Or uh, after you drop them off? Or uh, before you hop in the shower? What is something that you can do? And when are you going to do it? Okay? And then the third thing is, Aim for steadiness, not perfection. We are not interested in perfection. Why? Because it is a myth. So um, we're gonna, you're going to experience some setbacks. That's part of trying to make changes in yourself. And that's okay. What I would like you to do is to try to notice something that's going well every day and write it down. Research shows that if you can notice three good things that occur every day, that can help shift your mood. So write them down in a journal, and they don't have to be big and fancy, but we want to aim for steadiness. So we don't have to declutter the whole kitchen, we're just gonna start on the area to the left of the sink. I don't have to organize my whole new house, I'm just gonna start with, um, with uh, the living room, something that's not such a, a huge task, perhaps. So, um, and remember to consider asking a friend or a supportive family member to be your buddy, to be your accountability buddy for those things that are hard for you. And then you can do that for them. It's always easier for us to offer support and care to other people, uh, it seems, than to ourselves. So I'm curious in this year, um, uh, what is um, something that you can do um, that aims for steadiness in terms of a change and not perfection? And Susan says, oh dear, mindfulness for, or meditation was just a constant fail for me. Walking is a win. There's no right or wrong here. It's what's effective and what's not effective. And if, um, if mindfulness meditation is a fail for you, don't do it. We want to do things that make us feel good about ourselves, not things that make us feel bad about ourselves. And that um, is the idea of, of our self-care in 2024. We want to reduce stress by counteracting the things that are stressing us and finding solutions. So creating a system, a small system for what people do with their stuff when they get home from school and work, figuring out um, you know, a folder for where, how you're gonna separate your mail. One of my clients came into my office with a huge box of mail that had not been attended to for, I don't know, maybe two or three months. And I said, okay, um, before we, we meet and you bring this box, I want you to bring folders or other smaller boxes to put this in. And she was very excited because she loved going to an organizing store in the US called Staples. And she went to Staples and she came to the, the session with several folders. And we did exactly what I just said to you. We figured out what was trash. We put that in the trash. We figured out what was worth um, saving because it had to be attended to. And then we figured out what was something that um, she wanted to read or look over at another time. And we were very, very um, systematic. But she didn't do it alone, right? She had me. And so having me helped her um, get the motivation and, and stay on track for what was happening. So um, I, um, I'd love to hear from you some of your closing thoughts about what it is that you want to kind of head into for this, this year. Um, I'm having a little trouble with my com computer and the comments section and I have no idea why. 
I don't know why. Oh, there you go. Okay. So um, I'd love to hear a comment from you um, that you're taking away from this session uh, about um, what you're going to do for yourself this year and um, how you're going to work on one of your stated goals. So please add into the comment section, you know, what is something that you're going to do differently and how. Um, and I think that the thing is to agree that you're going to do this for a month, not the whole year, because I think that is a very big undertaking. Something smaller where you have a chance of actually following through. And if you can't follow through or it doesn't work, then it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. You're just going to pivot and do something else. Remember, our goal here is to be kinder to ourselves. Instead of beating yourself up, you want to say, I tried, that didn't really work. Let's see what else I can uh, move to. Lynn, get back on my, Pel my Peloton bike. That's great. How many times a week? Let's, do you want to start with once? Once a week could be good. Um, I'm taking away to forgive myself for what I didn't do and try again the next day. Fantastic, Tina. Great. Lee, meditation is a major self-care tool for me. I feel off balance if I don't do my daily meditation first thing in the morning. With ADHD, I'm learning that although I don't have the consistency with this that I would like, I'm accepting that it is okay. Anybody else want to share something? It is, it, it, persistence is about trying, maybe succeeding, trying again, trying maybe not you know being able to accomplish it and regrouping and trying again that is a growth mindset and that's what we want to live with lynn i would like to do it three times per week great pick your three days lynn good luck i want to hear about it next time laura i'm going to start chunking my decluttering tasks fantastic and sebastian nice to meet you going to the gym every year i sign up and end up going okay sebastian how many times a week pick a low number so that you can do it and then if you go more bravo well thank you so much for joining me today I um, I wish you health and happiness in this new year peace to our world and um, kindness to yourselves I'll see you in um, let's see I'll see you in two weeks uh, we'll be back and we'll be meeting every two weeks. So stay posted and uh, have a lovely weekend. Bye.